So welcome, uh, thanks for coming. I know their commission is not great, so not everyone uh, here in Nine Nine. But uh, today, uh, I would like to introduce Sophia, uh, who was the intern in our brand computer interface team. And that's very interesting that um, she was the last minute hire in our team, yet she managed to design, implement the experiment protocol, and go over here, stay one week, collect data, for uh, 10 participants and go back like two week, week break and then analyze all the results in 12 weeks. It's very impressive. Um, so for topic of today's presentation for her is improving tax prediction accuracy using your physiological uh, PCS study. So Sophia, yeah, please. Awesome, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Yoda and also Mike who have both mentored me for this project this summer. Um, I'll start by quickly introducing myself. Um, so I'm a, currently a PhD student at Georgia Tech School of Music studying music technology, um, but I am soon to transfer to the University of Colorado Boulder's Atlas Institute following my advisor. Um, and my research experience and interests thus far have mostly centered around um, behavioral and neurophysiological research in the area of music perception and cognition. Um, namely uh, areas like musically induced emotion, preference, and individual differences, as well as some creative work in using physiological signals for music performance. And for the talk today, I wanted to start by introducing the project background as well as um, other relevant research that's been done in this area, uh, followed by describing the experiment which we designed and um, ran uh, while I was an intern here, and the results from the data that we collected. And I also wanted to say just really quickly, I can no longer see the chat. So if there's any questions um, that come up, if someone wants to let me know, I'm happy to take questions during the performance, uh, during the, <laughs> the presentation. So predictive text uh, systems have been pretty widely um, integrated into technologies that we use every day. Um, for instance, we encounter them in our email applications, our laptop uh, or computer interfaces, um, our phone uh, messaging applications, and so on and so forth. However, despite these systems being um, fairly uh, widespread, they do still have their limitations. Uh, namely, as I'm sure many of us have experienced for ourselves as well, they're not always the most accurate or necessarily um, representative of what we, the user, are intending to type. And um, diving into why that is a little bit more, these systems tend to not be closed loop, meaning that um, they're not really capable of um, accepting like real time evaluation or learning from their mistakes uh, in real time and improving themselves in real time. Instead, they would have to depend on offline uh, feedback to do so. And as a result of that, as you might be able to imagine, um, continued errors or misrepresentations of the user's intention could have a negative impact on how much a user trusts these systems and their desire to uh, keep using them in the future. So all of this leads us to kind of the general um, driving question behind this project, which was if we could use brain computer interfacing to um, improve these types of predictive text interactions and um, predictive text accuracy as a whole. Um, there are several different types of brain computer interfaces, but specifically the type of BCI that we uh, want to focus on to address this challenge um, is passive BCIs. These operate by passively interpreting and recognizing things such as a user's um, intention or emotional state, et cetera. So they almost work kind of behind the scenes with a user's neurophysiology data, for instance, their um, EEG or brainwave data. And um, in particular, one uh, paradigm or way in which these passive BCIs can work is off of error-related potentials. Um, these are a specific type of event-related potential or signal pattern that can be found in EEG, which is evoked um, when an error is made or perceived. Um, this pattern of EEG activity has been observed in a variety of these scenarios in which error is involved, um, including a participant themselves making an error during, for instance, a reaction time task, um, people observing some autonomous system making an error, um, or uh, 
interacting with an interface which is misinterpreting your uh, intended action. And to illustrate what um, this may look like practically within a passive BCI, um, we have this figure here on the right, which at the top of the figure you can see we have a user um, with a passive BCI who is interacting with a system and their intention in this interaction is to move this cursor here to the left. However, the system uh, misinterprets their action and instead moves the cursor to the right. And when this happens, based on prior literature, we expect to see an error-related potential um, evoked in this user's uh, EEG data, which may look uh, something like this example signal here at the top right. Um, and when this uh, potential is evoked, it can be decoded um, in a passive BCI system and then implemented in, in a number of ways. One possibility is shown at the bottom left where the error is decoded from the EEG and then that's used to kind of automatically correct the erroneous action that was taken by the system. So the cursor um, moves back over to the left in this scenario. Uh, something else that can also be done is that this error is decoded and then that information is fed into uh, some sort of closed loop learning model where the system then learns that um, this was a misinterpretation of the user intention, uh, incorrect action, and then it uses that to continue to um, fine tune and improve itself over time as the user uh, keeps interacting with it. So with that in mind, I'm going to present um, four examples of prior works on error related potentials, as well as um, these closed loop type systems that I think are particularly relevant for the um, for this project. I'll start with uh, Ferez and Milan in 2008. Uh, they observed an error related potential being evoked when users were interacting with an interface that sometimes misinterpreted the intended action. So in their study, they had users interacting with a robot and they would tell the robot to, for instance, turn right, but that would sometimes uh, be interpreted as turn left or vice versa. And um, what these researchers did was create a single trial recognition or classification classification system, which could detect these error-related potentials uh, evoked from the user within each single trial of interaction. Um, and then in uh, their paper, they proposed that uh, such a classification system could be used, um, as is illustrated in the diagram here, where um, Within each single trial of interaction, if an error related potential is um, detected by this classifier, then that could be used to actually uh, negate any action taken by the system because it's been recognized as being a, a misinterpretation. Or conversely, if there is no error related potential detected um, during that interaction, then uh, the action is allowed to be executed. And similarly, uh, Schmidt and colleagues in 2012 uh, actually implemented a single trial online uh, system such as this um, within a ERP speller. So this is a type of uh, brain computer interface that's uh, essentially like a mental typewriter. And they implemented this um, single trial online error detection system within this uh, BCI paradigm, and they found that it increased the speed at which people were able to um, interact with the speller. In 2010, Chavariaga and Milan um, had participants observe an autonomous agent doing a task. In this case, it was moving a, a cursor towards a target. Um, and participants were only observing this agent doing the task and then assessing if it performed properly or not. Um, and what these researchers did was design a cognitive monitoring loop that used any error-related potentials that were um, evoked when this agent uh, made a mistake to help the agent uh, learn and improve as it uh, continued doing the task over time. And um, similarly, Chiang and colleagues in 2021, which this was actually a past uh, MSR intern project, um, they included a error-related potential detector within a traditional SSVEP paradigm to improve and help fine-tune the uh, SSVEP classifier as the user um, interacted with it. So the traditional um, SSVEP uh, BCI paradigm would be the component, uh, it's traditionally only the component in green here in the center, and they added this um, error detection 
feedback loop almost on the outside to um, provide this information to the SSVB classifier and continue to uh, fine tune it as the user interacts with it. So, so far we've seen how error related potentials in EEG can be used passively within a BCI system that is closed loop. Um, but the other component that we also wanted to add here to this project was the use of eye tracking and pupillometry information. And that was because incorporating this and um, creating an eye tracking EEG hybrid BCI system could uh, potentially greatly increase the feasibility and ease of use of such a system. However, there is, um, to our knowledge, not really a direct error-related uh, behavior or mechanism here for eye tracking like we've seen for the EEG data. So that adds kind of uh, an exploratory element to this project where we're trying to find through which eye tracking features could we um, potentially detect errors that are made by a predictive text system. Um, and there's many potential um, eye tracking features and metrics that we could choose from to do this. Um, so to narrow it down and inform our analysis a little bit, we uh, choose to look from other, uh, choose to look at other well-studied mechanisms and which features um, they analyze, um, which may also be involved here. So for instance, cognitive load or confusion or disorientation. Um, so to summarize, our project has three uh, main objectives. First, uh, our goal was to design a study exploring user neurophysiological responses to a predictive text system. And again, in particular, we were interested in exploring both EEG and eye tracking responses. Second, we were also interested again in seeing which of these eye tracking signals uh, might correspond to the EEG error related um, potentials that we would expect to see for our task. And lastly, we were also interested in seeing if it was possible to differentiate um, between different uh, user behaviors or, or types of users. For instance, a user who is uh, predictive text dependent or very committed to uh, using the predictive text system versus someone who is predictive text independent or not reliant on this system whatsoever. And uh, when I uh, get into the experimental design, I'll discuss how we uh, designed our experiment to allow us to explore this question. Um, in terms of the applications for a project like this, um, again, we're proposing a brain-computer interface, an assistive BCI, which is passive, hybrid, and a closed-loop system. And uh, to give Again, an, uh, an illustrative example of what this may look like as a BCI, I've uh, amended the figure that we saw earlier. So now we see our user interacting with a predictive text type system, and their intention is to type on my way to the store. However, as they um, are typing their message, the system incorrectly predicts the remainder of their message to be on my way to the office. So when this occurs, we're hypothesizing that we may see an error-related potential evoked in this user's um, EEG, as well as potentially any eye tracking um, signals related to this as well. And um, this error uh, signal could be decoded and then used or, or implemented in a number of different ways. Once again, it could be used as on the left to automatically uh, modulate what that prediction was that was offered to the user. Um, and in addition to that, it could also be fed into this closed loop learning model where the system learns that this was an erroneous prediction for this user and then continues to uh, fine tune and improve the predictive text system over time. So with all of this in mind, I'll now start describing the study which we designed and ran to um, explore those three main objectives that we have for this project. The task that we created was um, a self-paced uh, typing task of sentences in a simulated predictive text system. So uh, we did not implement a real predictive text model in this experiment, but rather um, the sentences which participants were to type were all uh, developed by us and predetermined. And the text predictions were not really predictions, but really um, pseudo-random, experimentally controlled generations within the sentence within each trial. 
The stimuli that we used were a set of 450 common English sentences, which we adapted from an in-lab data set. And um, we were able to recruit 10 participants uh, to complete our study. And we did uh, particularly recruit fluent English speakers due to the heavy English language component of this task. And then lastly, while participants were uh, completing the self-paced typing task, we were recording 32 channels of EEG data from them, as well as eye tracking pupillometry data. So next I'll go into the details um, and kind of the, the time course of what this task looked like. So each trial of the task began with one of those 450 sentences displayed on the screen inside of a uh, locked or fixed text box. Um, participants had three seconds to read uh, this target sentence and familiarize themselves with it before it was visually masked by a series of X's for one second. And then the visual mask disappeared, the text box unlocked, the cursor started blinking, and participants were able to uh, start typing out that target sentence verbatim. At some point as they're typing this target sentence, uh, text uh, prediction is generated for them uh, for the following word. In this example here, the generation occurs um, at the last word of the sentence. However, it, it was not always the last word. The location of the prediction was um, pseudo-randomized, so it could appear uh, somewhere in the middle of the sentence as well for certain trials. Uh, when the generated word appears, there was a 50% chance that the word presented was correct or a match to the target sentence. Um, and there was also a 50% chance that it was some other word or a mismatch to the target sentence. And after the generated word appears or the text generation appears, participants are able to take one of two possible actions. The first action is that they can press the tab key to accept the text prediction, which um, in which case the word remains on the screen and their cursor advances to the end of the line. The other action they can take is to reject the generated word, um, and they can do that by typing any uh, letter key on the keyboard, which uh, makes that generation word disappear and they're just left with whatever letter that they typed. So this is the time course essentially of, of a single trial of the self-paced typing task. And um, we're interested in one particular metric, um, behavioral metric here uh, within each trial, and that's what we're calling the reaction time labeled here on the timeline. We're defining their reaction time as the time from uh, when the generated word appears on the screen up until their next key press. So this is theoretically the amount of time that uh, it takes for participants to make any um, judgments or evaluations on the text generation that was made and then decide which course of action to take. Participants complete um, 50 of these trials um, sequentially in a run that takes about 10 minutes and they complete nine of these runs uh, throughout the course of the whole experiment, which gives us 450 trials per participant. And that was also the number of sentences which we um, were using as stimuli. Um, the other thing that we introduce for these repeated runs are these uh, three different uh, user scenarios or user behaviors. So at the start of each um, run, we may prompt participants to kind of act under one of these three user behaviors. The first option is that we, uh, we may ask them to be uh, predictive text dependent, meaning that um, they are to be completely reliant on the predictive text system, take as much advantage of it as they can. Practically what this means is that when the generated word appears on the screen, if the word is a match, they are to always press the tab key to accept the correct word. Um, of course, if the word is a mismatch, they uh, don't have to accept the wrong word. They can just continue to type the correct word normally. But if it is a match, they're told to always accept the word. Um, we may also, for some, uh, for some uh, runs, we also ask participants to be completely predictive text independent. What this means is that um, they were to not rely on the predictive text whatsoever. 
Um, and even in scenarios where it was the correct word and could potentially have been helpful to them. So practically when under this um, user scenario, participants are told to never press the tab key to accept a text generation, but instead always just continue to type out the word themselves normally. And lastly, for some trials, or sorry, for some runs, um, we left that decision completely up to the participant. They were free to interact with the uh, system in any way that uh, they liked completely to their own discretion. Um, here we have some uh, images showing what our uh, data collection experimental setup looked like. Um, we see the users were seated at a desk um, with a computer monitor and keyboard in front of them. Um, they were resting their heads on a chin rest, which we use to uh, help limit um, head movement during the task, which could cause some uh, artifacts in the physiological data which we were recording. And of course, they're fitted with the 32 channels of EEG and the eye tracker is mounted at the bottom of the screen. Um, and all of our data streams, the eye tracker, the EEG, as well as the stimulus timing information and their key presses from the system are all being recorded um, by a software called Lab Streaming Layer, um, which record records all of those data streams uh, simultaneously. And on the right, um, I'm going to play this short video here, which shows a participant uh, interacting with um, two uh, trials from this task uh, to show an example of what this looked like in real time. So we see the target sentence is displayed on the screen, followed by a mask, and when it disappears, he begins to type the sentence. There is a, a correct generation that appeared for him, so he hit tab to accept it and then continues to type out the remainder of the sentence. He hits enter when he's done, and then after some time, a new sentence um, appears for the following trial, and he begins the same process again. This time, the word that was generated was uh, incorrect or a mismatch, so he just typed the word uh, normally. So now we'll talk about. Um, I'll get into the data analysis and our results, but I will first start with um, how we cleaned our data and removed um, bad trials and outliers. Um, to start off with, uh, if there were any trials which we identified that the stimulus presentation software took longer than 100 milliseconds to present that uh, text generation, we removed those trials. Um, there were only very few trials in which this actually occurred, but if we did see that there was some sort of no noticeable lag within a trial, um, we did remove it from the analysis. We also removed trials in which um, participants did not interact with the text generations as intended. So for instance, um, if, the gener if the text prediction was generated more than one time, um, we removed those trials. This occurred if oftentimes when participants had um, past the point in the sentence where the generation occurred, but then realized that they had made a typo in an earlier part of the sentence. And so they backspaced all the way uh, to correct that typo. And then as they were going through the sentence again, of course, because this was an, uh, a simulated predictive text environment, the same word was generated in the same position again. Um, so whenever this happened for, for certain trials, we, we removed um, those instances. Uh, similarly, if the text prediction for a certain trial was um, never generated or was skipped, we also removed those trials as well. Uh, this occurred when the uh, text prediction was supposed to uh, occur on the last, uh, last word of the sentence. However, as participants were typing out the target sentence, they may have uh, slightly rephrased the sentence so that it was fewer words than the original target. And because of that, they never actually uh, typed out enough words to get to the point of the text generation. And lastly, we also remove trials in which um, we calculate that participant reaction time to be less than 150 milliseconds. Um, and this is based off of the time of like the human visual processing system. So if a uh, participant's reaction time is less than 150 milliseconds, um, that gives us some indication that they perhaps did not uh, have enough time to process what the text generation was before they re uh, reacted to it. So we remove those trials as well. 
And then lastly, we do some more generic outlier removal. For instance, for that uh, behavioral metric, the reaction time, we do a um, outlier removal uh, via z-score method. And for our physiological data, for the EEG and eye tracking data, we did have to remove three participants' data due to excessive artifacts. So um, for physiological data, when we get to that analysis, we are only looking at seven participants' data. Okay, so I will start with the results from our behavioral analysis. Um, and again, for the behavioral analysis, we are looking at this variable of reaction time, which we defined as the time between the text generation appearing on the screen until the following key press. Um, we averaged uh, participants' reaction times, the reaction times from all of the trials within uh, match and mismatch conditions of each of the three user scenarios for each participant. Uh, we then ran a two-way repeated measures ANOVA on the reaction time variable, which uh, revealed both the user scenario as well as the match or mismatch condition of the word. Um, it revealed that both of those had a significant overall effect on the reaction time. And we can look at these effects in a little more detail um, illustrated in the plot on the left. Specifically, we can look at um, pairwise comparisons between our various conditions, and the significant pairwise comparisons are um, annotated using the bars and asterisks at the top of the plot. Um, if we first look across the three user scenarios here on the x-axis, um, we can visually see the effect um, of the user scenario on the reaction time. In particular, we'll note that the uh, reaction time in the dependent scenario for both the match and mismatch text conditions uh, was revealed to be significantly different from their counterparts in the independent scenario or the free choice blocks. Um, so this supports that uh, the user scenario prompts that we were uh, giving participants at the start of each run were in fact driving their behavior and influencing their behavior during the task. Um, furthermore, if we look at the within each user scenario and compare the match versus mismatch conditions, we do see another interesting trend, which is that the match reaction time uh, tends to be longer or slower than the mismatch reaction time. So um, we see that participants tend to react faster to mismatch text predictions. Um, these comparisons don't reach statistical significance in the dependent or free choice cases, so you don't see them annotated um, at the top. However, uh, interestingly, it does reach statistical significance in the independent user scenario. And this was sort of an interesting result to see um, and is actually contrary to what we were expecting because the independent uh, user scenario is the one in which um, they theoretically do not need to uh, attend as much to the uh, judgment of whether the word is a match or a mismatch um, to the target sentence, because no matter what, they're told that they will always be rejecting the predicted uh, word. Um, so if anything, we were actually expecting to see a significant match versus mismatch difference for the dependent scenario because that's the scenario where they're really attending most closely to the text. They need to pay attention if it's uh, correct or not because that uh, directly influences what action they are to take. Um, so this was an interesting result to see and um, if anyone has uh, any ideas or theories about um, why we see the most significant um, difference here in this independent scenario, uh, we certainly be happy to hear any, any of those theories. But to summarize our behavioral results, we do see clearly distinguished response patterns um, between the user scenarios, specifically when users are heavily relying on the predictive text system versus when they are not relying on it at all or only partially relying on it. And we also see this trend suggesting that participants um, may react faster to these incorrect text generations um, compared to the correct text generations. Okay, so next I will share our uh, the results 
from our EEG analysis, specifically um, this error-related potential analysis. Um, and I will also quickly say that since the proposed um, application for this project um, was uh, or uh, is for a like real-time BCI type of application, we did mainly stick to light pre-processing methods. Um, we didn't apply, for instance, uh, ICA or anything like that in our pre-processing pip pipeline. So for our analysis, we start with the EEG data for the dependent scenario only. And we'll start with this since participants are again the most reliant on the text generations uh, during this scenario. So we expect this uh, portion of the data to show maybe the clearest uh, effect, the clearest error related effect here. For our analysis, we are also um, only looking at the uh, EEG channel FZ. Um, this is a uh, channel uh, located here if you use the um, scalp diagram as a reference along the midline towards the front of the head. And we choose this channel because prior work on error related potentials has consistently characterized them um, by using these frontal and uh, central midline channels in this region, which includes the FC channel. So to analyze our data, we epoch the EEG data such that um, time zero here is the time that the text generation appears on the screen. And we look at the window from 100 milliseconds um, prior to that text generation appearing through one second afterwards. Um, we also calculate the grand average potentials across all participants, which is what's plotted here in the figure. So the grand average for all participants for their match trials plotted in blue, um, as well as the mismatch trials plotted in orange. And we're also visualizing the 95% confidence interval here in addition to the mean response. Um, we're also calculating the difference potential that is the mismatch minus match signal plotted in black here. Um, and this is something that's frequently done in error related potential uh, type analyses. For statistical testing, we test for portions within this epoch where the match and the mismatch signals um, differ significantly from one another using the Wilcoxon sign rank test. Um, and any portions uh, of this epoch in which these signals differ significantly, we've highlighted in, uh, in green on this uh, different signal. So we do see um, several uh, features or um, or uh, time areas in which uh, this signal, um, the differences between these two conditions, the signals differed significantly. And then finally at the bottom, we can also um, visualize a representation of participants' response times for both the match and mismatch trials in relation to the EEG data that's shown. So now we have this match or sorry, mismatch minus match um, difference potential, which we can compare um, the, uh, the features of this potential to other error related potentials that have been reported in similar prior works. Um, so for instance, if we take the Ferez and Milan paper, which I referenced earlier, um, this study used a similar uh, interaction style paradigm uh, like we did in ours. And they also have the same um, error rate that we have, which is 50%. And uh, that may be important because it's been shown that the um, error rate that's used in these types of studies corresponds to the amplitude of the EEG response that's observed. So a smaller error rate um, or less frequent errors um, has been shown to result in like a larger uh, amplitude EEG response. And if we look, if we compare the, the amplitudes of the responses of, of our data and that of Ferez and Milan, we do see that they look like they fall within similar ranges. Um, the other interesting finding from their paper here was um, this feature of the error related potential um, after 400 milliseconds, this negative deflection here. And they identify this as a um, unique uh, characteristic to interaction error related potentials. So this is in comparison to other types of error related potentials such as um, the observation potential or um, uh, participants themselves making an error. 
um, this was a feature that occurred um, kind of uniquely for their interaction paradigm. And if we look at uh, a later paper from Salazar Gomez and colleagues um, who also have an interaction style um, paradigm, we see uh, again this negative deflection following uh, 400 milliseconds. Um, and interestingly, we also see this positive peak uh, immediately afterwards starting around 600 milliseconds as well. So we can compare these features from um, prior uh, interaction paradigm works to um, the signals that we're seeing in our study, and we do see some similarities in the, the characteristics of the signal that we're calculating. So um, next, now that we see some evidence that an error-related potential is in fact invoked or uh, evoked by our task, um, we can compare this response between the dependent versus the independent user scenarios. So since these two uh, scenarios, these two sets of trials differed in how much participants were relying on the, um, the text generations to complete the task, we would expect there to also be a difference in how uh, they may perceive uh, system errors or incorrect text generations. So now the black trace from our previous plot is now the blue uh, blue trace in this plot, the dependent um, mismatch minus match potential. And we've also plotted the mismatch minus match difference from the independent scenario trials as well. And the black trace now is the difference between uh, dependent minus independent. And from the Wilcoxon test comparing these two signals, we do see two um, regions that were identified as being uh, significantly different between these two user scenarios. One centered around about 200 milliseconds and the other centered around approximately 600 milliseconds. Um, so to summarize our EEG analysis, we do again see um, some evidence of an EEG error-related potential evoked as a result of these incorrect text predictions. Um, which suggests that it may be possible to uh, detect when these uh, incorrect text predictions occur using EEG data. And furthermore, um, we also see significant differences uh, in between features of the error-related potential according to the user scenario or how um, reliant participants were on the predictive text system. So it may be also possible to determine um, participants uh, or users' reliance on the system from uh, characteristics of their EEG response as well. And last but not least, I will discuss the uh, results from our eye tracking analysis. Um, again, this was the more exploratory portion of our analysis. Um, and for it, we chose to use the, we chose to look at the um, the pupil response to start off with as our eye tracking me metric for this analysis. In particular, we're calculating a metric uh, abbreviated as PCPD, which is percent change in pupil diameter. This is calculated by um, finding participants average pupil diameter throughout the uh, whole course of the task and using that as a baseline uh, by which you're calculating a percent change of their pupil diameter over time. And doing that allows us to uh, more easily make comparisons between participants because we're removing kind of that baseline um, individual difference. So we see similar style plots as before. I'll point out that the uh, epoch or time window for um, these analyses is a little different now. We're looking from um, negative 100 milliseconds all the way through to two seconds. Um, so a little bit longer of a time window. Again, this is informed by um, prior work and analysis methods for pupil diameter. And we also see the side-by-side -side comparisons um, of the response during the dependent user scenario versus the independent user scenario, um, showing the match and mismatch responses in both. So within each plot, we're seeing the grand average across all of our participants again for the match trials, which are shown in blue, and the mismatch trials, which are shown in orange, um, again with the 95% confidence interval um, notated as well. And once again, we've also calculated the mismatch minus match 
uh, difference of these uh, signals shown in black here with um, areas where the two conditions differ significantly highlighted uh, in, in green in both of these plots. And again, you can also see the response times for reference for the match and mismatch conditions um, for each scenario under their corresponding plot. Um, so for the discussion, I'm going to begin by focusing on the early part of the response for both of these um, user scenarios. Um, and I'll, I'm going to define the early part of the response as the portion starting from uh, time equals zero, which is when the generation appears on the screen, up until uh, before participants uh, make their uh, following key press. And I'm going to focus on this part of the response because uh, during this time, we know that the visual presentation on the screen remains uh, constant. There's no change because participants have not made um, their key press yet. And I'll explain a little bit uh, in a little bit why that's uh, an important distinction to make. But if we look at this early part of the response in the dependent scenario, we see evidence of a greater pupil dilation um, if the generated word is a mismatch and constriction if the word uh, is a match, although this difference does not reach um, statistical significance according to the Wilcoxon test. But um, this is in direct contrast to the independent user scenario where there's almost no difference between the match and uh, mismatch uh, pupil response during this time. So um, the reason why I wanted to focus on the early part of the response first was because um, in the time after participants uh, make their first key press, um, in the dependent scenario, there is, uh, we discovered actually a difference in the visual stimulus that's presented on the screen depending on the condition. So if you recall the outline of the trial from earlier, in the, in the dependent user scenario, if the generated word is a match, participants are told to always um, hit tab and accept the word, in which case the generated word remains on the screen. However, it's a if, it's a, if the generated word is a mismatch, um, they are to just type out the correct word normally, and this causes the generated word to disappear from the screen. So there's this difference in the visual stimulus being shown across the match and mismatch conditions for the dependent user scenario. And it is possible that um, even though we do see a uh, difference in the response here between these two conditions, it's possible that because this visual difference exists between these two conditions, um, that that could amount to a difference in screen luminance, which uh, to which the pupil response is very sensitive to. So we're not actually sure at this point, how much of the uh, difference in the response that we're seeing here in the latter part of the epoch is um, due to any effect of the experimental con condition versus a potential confounding variable of screen luminance. So that would require a little bit more testing in order to determine um, or tease those two apart a little bit more. Um, however, I will mention that in the case of the independent user scenario, there is uh, no such variation in the visual stimulus between match and mismatch conditions. So recall in the independent user scenario, um, regardless of what the generated word is, participants are always told to reject the prediction and just type out the word um, normally themselves. So uh, the visual stimulus uh, is uh, constant between these two conditions. And interestingly, our data still shows a slight difference in the pupil response between the match and mismatch conditions in the time after participants key press. Um, visualizing the confidence intervals with both of these responses, it seems like this difference in the response is very small. Um, so I'm not sure, um, I guess, how much uh, weight to really place on this result. Um, but it is interesting that we potentially still see a difference here, again, in the independent scenario where we wouldn't expect to see um, any significant differences between the match or mismatch conditions. Um, so again, this is a, a scenario where we welcome any, um, any feedback or, or suggestions or follow-up um, about these results, because um, there are 
uh, exploratory portion of the project, and we're interested to hear what, what people have to say about this. But to summarize what um, our results suggest so far, um, we do see trends suggesting that the early part of the response, again, prior to the key press, um, the pupil response may vary uh, during uh, this early portion according to both whether the text prediction is uh, mismatch or match, correct or incorrect, um, as well as potentially how much a user is relying on the system, if they're reliant on it, committed to using it, or if they are um, completely typing independent of it. But again, more testing and research is likely needed um, in this domain, especially to uh, clarify any response that we're seeing in this latter portion of the dependent scenario epoch. Um, so to summarize our um, project, we designed uh, and implemented a, um, a study exploring user neurophysiological responses to a predictive text system. We collected a data set of both EEG and eye tracking data for this. And from our analysis so far, we see that even with light pre-processing methods, our results seem to suggest that it may be possible to distinguish erroneous and correct um, text predictions, as well as potentially differentiate um, different user states or levels of user dependence um, on such a predictive text system through neurophysiology data. And all of this um, supports that this, these types of classifications may be well suited for use in a real-time closed-loop BCI type of application. For next steps, um, we are currently working on writing a paper which we are planning to submit to uh, the IEEE uh, Engineering Medical Biology Society conference. Um, and um, although this is my last week as an intern, um, next steps would include uh, looking towards online classification and um, implementation of our results within some sort of closed loop model. So that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank the participants who participated in our study without whom there would be no data to analyze. Um, again, thank uh, my mentors, Yoda and Mike, as well as the audio and acoustics and BCI teams um, that I was a part of for all of their uh, support and, and feedback throughout my internship. I'd also uh, like to give a special thank you to um, our partners for this project, Namanja Jurich and uh, Yang Chang, um, and a shout out to the research interns that um, were with me this summer who I got to uh, got to know throughout uh, my time here. Uh, and also thank you to the to MSR and the research intern pro program for all of uh, your support this summer. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody. Thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, Mike, you're on mute. Mike, you're mute. Unmute. Ah. Thanks very much. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I was just saying that I, I know that Yoda has a very important um, ping pong tournament that he has to get to in a few minutes. Um, so he asked me to to take over here. Um, thank you very much for the uh, warm um, uh, the applause for, for Sophia. Um, let's turn now to some questions from the audience. Uh, um, I see that Hannes Gamper in, in the chat asks, he says he's curious whether you tracked typing accuracy and whether that differs between conditions. So um, by typing accuracy, um, do you mean how closely the, I guess the rest of the sentence uh, matched with the target or um, I guess, could you elaborate what you mean by that? Yeah, that, but also the also the target itself. I'm curious in the in the independent condition whether there was a a difference in accuracy at all. 
Um, so by accuracy here, let me go back for a second <laughs> through a lot of slides so that we can see the. Uh, this part. Um, so by Basically, accuracy, whether, yeah. yeah. Whether they typed the correct word that what was the, were they like in general mm -hmm. they they recalled the sentences exactly and there were no issues with with uh not remembering the target word for example yeah i think from from our observations the target word was um not the issue if there was any sort of memory issue um it did sometimes happen um which is what I was mentioning during the data cleaning process where they kind of rephrased other portions of the sentence. And because um, this was like a completely simulated environment, um, rephrasing so that there were fewer or more words kind of impacted the um, how the text generation worked or how it was perceived. Um, so we ended up removing those trials if they rephrased the sentence and that impacted the the target text generation, for instance, um, we we removed those trials. Oh, Does I that, see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then for the um, for the the cases where everything was correct except for the target word, you're saying that there were no cases where they got that wrong. Or I'm just well, I'm I trying to I'm trying to understand if there's other ways of explaining that. Uh, that uh, difference in response times for the independent users. Right, so if, if, um, if for instance, in the independent case, um, they, they didn't type the, the target word, but they remembered it as being something else, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think we had trials in which that occurred. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about the uh, protocol, um, uh, Yvonne asks, can you please show the slide with the response times? Um, it seems like the independent users have the fastest response. Does that mean in general text prediction slows down the typing? Um, I'm not sure if text like just um, text prediction systems like slow down the typing or if it was um, more of like a I think attribute of the the task itself if that makes sense the instruction um, I, I think um, response time is also different from the time to completion which we're not showing here right. so yeah, so yeah. in this case, it's it's just the time until roughly the next key press. Right, That's so it. yeah, so it is possible. That's a good point that the, the overall time of completion of the sentence, um, we didn't look at that, um, that data, but that could be interesting. Um, it's possible that that time of completion is much faster for the uh, conditions in which they were taking advantage of the predictive text versus where they had to type out the word themselves completely. Um, but I think the reaction time here is one reason it could be significantly lower for the independent scenario is um, essentially they don't have to make any um, decision or judgment on the uh, generated word because they're told that no matter what they are to um, always just continue to type the word themselves. So there's no, never like an adjustment in the, um, the motor plan or the next action that has to be made depending on if it's um, on, on what the word is, if that makes sense. OK, thank you. Um, we have another question from Dimitra, um, this time about the eye tracking results. Uh, yeah. So uh, you mentioned earlier that the second part of the response time may be slightly masked by the difference in screen illumination caused between the match and the mismatch conditions. Um, can you can you talk, speak a little bit more about uh, um, slightly less the slightly less illumination in the Oh, Dimitri, maybe you can take over now. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm in a busy environment. Um, basically, I'm just wondering if you can test that theory because 
you expect that when in the match condition you have more black pixels in the screen, so you're expecting the dilation to be larger perhaps. So if can you test that and see whether you can actually still use the second half of your plot or not? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, the other day, Yoda and I were actually talking about this. We had the idea of um, we could uh, run the trial again. We don't need participants for this, but we just run the same script and we can attach a um, some sort of photo sensor or something like that to the screen um, at that position. And then we can measure if uh, if there's actually a difference in luminance or what that difference is um, between the match scenarios where the text stays on the screen, you have those black pixels there versus the mismatch where it disappears and it's replaced by like gray pixels, I guess. So yeah, that's something that we could uh, definitely test with the um, with the uh, software and the the experiment that we have right now. Um, okay. So, I, yeah, th thanks very much, Sophia. Um, mm -hmm. On this particular plot, I see in the summary it says trend suggests the early less than 500 milliseconds people response may vary according to the. Um, however, uh, just above that in the two mismatch RT match, it looks like the x axis is going to two seconds. Um, and, and where this seems like the, the the green significance is actually more closer to one second, if that's the same axis. All right, I just want to make sure that the yeah. axis on this plot is is correct, and how that relates to the um, result. Or you're summarizing that it's less than 500 milliseconds. Oh yes, yeah. so the axes are correct. So the excuse me, the significant portion that was. Um, revealed by the Wilcoxon test, it is um, around one second for both of the dependent and the independent scenarios. Um, and that is after the user's key press. Um, so in the case of the dependent scenario, like we're not, again, we're not sure if this is a significant difference because of um, like luminance for any reason or if it's completely because of the experimental condition. Um, the summary, point I was referring to the um, the early part of the response so before the um, before participants key press in both the dependent and independent scenario um, so uh, yeah like you pointed out this portion of it was not marked uh, as being like significantly different between the two conditions but we do still see um, maybe some sort of trend that suggests that um, there is this difference in um, pupil dilation between match and mismatch in the dependent scenario, which um, the difference is like much smaller, if any, in the independent scenario. The responses between these two conditions are almost the same during this early portion. OK. Oh, I yeah. see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hannes has a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, just going back to the to Dimitra's question and and your idea with the um, measuring the luminance that could that could certainly work. But I'm also wondering if you might have enough enough uh, data already based on your experimental design where you could just compare, um, let's say, the, basically what you're trying to measure is whether the addition of an extra word changes luminance significantly to the point where it would um alter the pupil dilation right so i wonder right. if there's other if there are other measurement points in the data that you've collected where you could just compare that between between um like say mm. this is a crude example which might not be good for this but before you start typing anything the, the screen is blank but the same gray pixels as you used throughout the test once they're done typing there's a bunch of words on screen right is there a significant difference between those two pupil dilations I know that's, that's yeah. there's a lot of confounding variables here because this is before the task and after the task. But I wonder if within your test you might have similar points. So you, you basically wouldn't have to rely on a separate measurements that might raise questions about is this really the same as looking at the screen? Like does the, mm. is the, the luminance meter, does it really have the performance of the human eye and, and so on? Uh, you might be able to just compare different different portions of the data you already have to show whether or not you think there might be a difference. 
Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, yeah, we could actually look at um, maybe portions of the trial um, that are you know not within this epoch, so it's not close to the time of the text generation, but maybe just at the um, early parts of the sentence, like before the generated word appears when they type and they add words to the screen. If there's any yeah. effect of yeah, those extra black pixels. Right. Yeah. OK, uh, any questions uh, from the remote audience? Any other questions? OK, how about for the in-person audience? Any uh, final questions? OK, last chance. <laughs> uh, one, <laughs> going once, twice, three times. OK, let's let's thank Sophia. One more time.